All right, so today we have Jim Swanson, and he served in the Korean War. His birth date is November 30th, 1931, mm -hmm. and we are in South Dakota, and this is being conducted by the Red Cross. So we're just going to start by getting some background information on you. Um, so where were you born, Jim? Uh, Madison, South Dakota. Madison, South Dakota? Yes, that is okay. correct. Okay. And then you lived in Madison no, growing up? I lived on a farm. We kept coming south, so we live now about 14 miles from Sioux Falls. Okay. What Where, did your parents do? What did your parents do? They farmed. Farmers? Okay. Both deceased. Did you have any siblings? Only no. child? You were no. the only child? One brother has passed away. One brother passed away? Yeah, but far as any other nothing mother and father passed away and so I'm the only one my nephew lives down the road from a mile I work pretty close with him he's handled most of my finances now because this bills keep coming in okay you said you had one brother though yes deceased he's deceased yes was did he serve in the military at all no, he had a brain tumor operation. He had no skull back here. Oh, no. So they wouldn't not take him. They wouldn't take him, okay. He tried to enlist, but they wouldn't take him. How old were you when you enlisted? Eighteen. Okay. What were you doing before you enlisted? Were you in school? Were you working? I was working uh, various jobs, and all at once the Korean War come along, and I said, what the heck, I'm going to be... Drafted anyway, so I just well enlist and get it over. So you chose the Marine Corps? That is correct. Why did you choose the Marine Corps over the other branches? I guess it's glory. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I always remember they said if you got shot out in front of the line, they'd get you back. They wouldn't leave you out there. Oh, I just heard that, and I remember that. I still think that to this day. So you enlisted, and then from there you went to basic training. That is correct, in Camp Pendleton, California. Okay. North of San Diego, 37 miles. South of L.A., approximately 90 miles. How long were you there? Uh... Uh, various periods of time, I was there till about 19, spring in 1952. I went to bomb disposal school in, in Indian Head, Maryland, about 30, 40 miles south of D.C. Mm -hmm. So, bomb, excuse me, bomb disposal school. What, that is correct. What does that entail? Taught you how to dismantle or unexploded bombs, mortar rounds, artillery, anything that was hurting something or word, so you couldn't blow it up where it was at. You had to do something else, disarm it some way. All right, so how how long did that training take? Because I'm sure that was very intense. It, that's three months. Three months, okay. Spring of 1952. And then in July, they sent me to Korea and returned October 20th of the same year. They just keep us there for three months because of the hazardous duty. Like I think I mentioned, I got hazardous duty pay even in the United States here. Mm -hmm. So you, from your bomb school, you went over to Korea for three months. Yeah, I was in... Uh, Camp Pendleton, California for a few weeks and then sent me to Korea with six other men. Okay. How can you describe that experience, those first three months, your first initial three months going over for the first time? What was that like? What I expected, I...
I always figure I should come back. Mm -hmm. Take your time, and if you don't feel comfortable answering something, you no, don't. No, that's have okay. To. No, no, okay. No, no. Let my emotions get the best of me. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. And just take your time. Yeah, I'm okay. Good. Just do. Do you want to describe anything that happened over there, or do you want to move on? We don't it, have to. No, that, it uh, happened. There's no fabrication. This is true. Yes. There was an artillery round laying in the water, right in the edge, unexploded. There's two other fellows with me with a truck or a small truck, but not a huge one. But. I picked it up and put it in the back of the truck. And right away, I remember from Indian and Maryland, do not move if it's been unexploded. And I told the other two fellows to get around the bend there a little bit, and I picked her up and set her back. Maybe still there today, as far as I know. And then, emotionally, the biggest thing. On the last Sunday I was there, which would have been in October, I was on a hill there. Here they come dragging two dead, I don't know, there's North Korean, American, rope around their ankles, and there were two of them. Just drug them on the ground. And all I could see on them, one of them marked between his eyes and the other one had it on his ankle, but they was corpses. One time, first time I was under fire, in Ju July 26, 1952, took me up to a place there and supposed to be an artillery round. I heard something go over, I thought it was a bird or anything, and pretty soon they started artillery fire starting to come in. I was new there and the other fellow's been there while he said, get down. We got down a bit and then we walked right in to where the artillery shell was coming from, up a hill, right in their, right in their teeth. And it was so muddy that I remember just a bit. I said to myself, if any artillery comes, I won't go down, because I'll never make her back up. And then they went up to the line one night about midnight. It's supposed to have been a mortar round on top of a bunker. Just got up there, and they always took me up there, because I wasn't familiar with it. I might drive. In. And just as dark as night, it was night. Well, the fellow in the bunker, I couldn't see him, and he couldn't see me. When are you going home? I said, oh, I got about six weeks. Oh. I got about six months. I still remember that. Was Another time I, this was about noon, they had they had a, an exploded ordnance out of distance. Jamie, the Christmas, there's a bunch of trees right in the just a little ways, and the first thing I thought, oh, it was snipers. And uh, he said, yes. And I said, well, let's go. Went out there, got there, the North, or the South Korean pointed out the rice paddy. Where's it at? He said, in the rice paddy. Do you know exactly where it's at? No. Is it hurting anything? No. Let's get out of here. We just went back to the vehicle, the truck. <laughs> But then there's four incidents that I remember in my mind. As long as I live, I'll remember. I can put your go verbatim on the dates this happened, the day I was under fire. Last Sunday I was in Korea when they drug the bodies down the hill on the end of a rope. So then after I'd been there about two weeks, 
that's when I picked up the rocket and explored along the river. There's four incidents. I don't know if I got them all or not, but that's that's the ones that really got me. And those were all within your first three months over there. Or that was your full. Well, I was just over there three months. So I had stress. Okay. And that all happened with the three month within the three month period. It all happens within three months. The twenty sixth of uh, July when first under fire and. Then later on, but the last Sunday I was there, that's when they come dragging the dead bodies down the hill. I don't know to this day whether there's North Korean, South Korean, or U.S. I rather doubt if they treat U.S. We went up there. I don't remember what it was. It was a Sunday morning. Lieutenant and a tech sergeant from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Went up there and I don't know what they was up there for, but they took me along. And that's what I saw. My biggest thrill was when I got off the plane at Seoul. I said, "I'm here. I can go back face people like you." I wasn't no draft dodger. I enlisted. You're proud of that. Yes, ma'am, I did. Very much so. I didn't want to go back and face you and you and you that I hadn't arrived, dodged it. At least I'd been there. So you were there for three months. What was the, the atmosphere like as far as your housing, the food? Lived in a tent with, I believe there were six of us, and then the lieutenant was in a separate place. Mm -hmm. There's a tent, and we, uh, six of us, and they'd call me or one of the others up the line all hours of the night. Didn't make any difference. We had an unexploded round. I think I remember one thing. I trapped a lot of mink here in South Dakota. I remember one day I was driving the truck road, and here come a mink across the road. And I thought to myself, by golly, this might be a good place to trap. <laughs> 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 so it hadn't gone right from me. That's good. I had so many experiences. Washington, D.C., they flew me from L.A to Washington, D.C., and in Maryland, about 20 miles south. Mm -hmm. So I took, went up to Washington, D.C., and going to take a train back. I sat in kind of a round bench there for a while. I got up and walked around all at once. I realized I'd left my orders lay there. I went back, and they was there. Kansas City, I changed over to the airplane, and they asked me, what Kansas City or Yen? I said, I don't know. All I know it was in Kansas City. That same night, some people come up to me, had a envelope, but they had some papers they wanted me to take to LA. And they treated me very well, but uh, nowadays I'd be scared of drugs, but didn't know. They treated me very well. I believe they took me to eat. So overall, the people that would feed you or your your um, superiors, they all w treated you fair and well. How was that? That isn't quite a f true factor. I realize it's coming from you. You don't know. Mm -hmm. But the lieutenant, plain words, he had no guts. Every time it was his turn to go up to the line and explode. You always have something to do, or you couldn't go. So then it was up to me, or he's one other, uh, he was staff tech sergeant from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And he said one day, Jim, he said, you see what's going on? And I said, no. He said, every time you need somebody to go up the line and take a look at ammunition or something, he's always busy. And then I 
sent me realized a while and he was very true. You know, I said something to do. And I say no guts and I mean to this day. Did all seven of you come back after those three? That is correct. Mm -hmm. We had one fellow from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and the Lieutenant Woodle, I believe he was from Iowa somewhere, and then there's three other enlisted men beside of me, I think that'll total six or seven, whatever, but there was and I was staff I was a sergeant then. You had to be first. You didn't send the enlisted men to do something. I was supposed to be doing it. The lieutenant was there, it was his turn, he was supposed to go up. Any hour of the night or day. Any hour of the night or day. So I'm sure you became very close with those six other people you went over there with? Not really. Not really? Oh no. Lieutenant Quartz, or Lieutenant Woodle, he was, he was, it wasn't too bad, but like I say, he shunned his duty. And this Carl Quartz from Cedar Rapids Highway, he was, he was pretty good. He didn't try to shun, he nothing he held back. And I didn't either. They said, go. I went. I had no choice. Send South Korean soldiers out the outpost at night, and they're supposed to come in in the morning. I never come in, you go out there and they're sleeping. It never happened to me, but one day we was near the Marine Corps Hospital, right back the line. Pretty soon a truck, covered truck, pulled up there. We all knew what was in there. <laughs> Dead Marines. They didn't have to tell us, we knew. I'll never forget that. It's PTSD, why? I remember my dreams, I was on the ground, and the China was re ready to stick a bayonet in my left side. Right? Another time I woke up and I had a knife and I just killed a Chinaman. And then I woke up. I killed one and still swinging at the other ones. But then I woke up. So you've struggled with the PTSD ever since you got back. That is correct. They treated me at the VA at Sioux Falls and I mean pills and various medications that I believe very much has helped. How All of this is true now. This yes. is no fabrication. Mm -hmm. I know the two names of the Two people that with me that day, I picked up the rocket down by the water. Frank Lucky and Andrew Vidal, his name. There's three of us. Sometimes you drive, see a sign. From this point on, you're under observation. But you try to drive across the field, it just opens, it is here. I guess the biggest thing is, I could say I was there. Didn't try and dodge it. I'd been around exposed to army men somewhat. I heard them, they was drilling there in Camp Pendleton. Someone of superior rank told him to hurry up. 
He said, yeah, all right. If you'd done that in the Marine Corps, you'd been court-martialed. You did not talk back. You did not have anything to do with your superiors. One time, uh, Lieutenant Keller was there, and Sergeant Quartz, and me, this other big guy, Corporal, I was probably about staff sergeant. He came up and put his hand on my shoulder. This lieutenant said to me, if I ever see that again, I'm going to bust you. You just didn't have no fraternization. I was a company banker. I didn't, I've gambled a lot since I got out, but I didn't then because I'd get paid about four o'clock in the afternoon and get the tablecloth out and play cards. I was a banker. They, heck, I like to sleep. This fellow from California, he always called me Swede. I need some money. I said, it's in the locker room. <laughs> <laughs> I trusted him. He was a pretty decent guy. One night, here in the United States, the sergeant of the guard, so we had to check on him. They had one this one person. Uh, he was on guard duty down at the motor pool a little ways away. I went down there, and I see nobody. I looked up in the truck. Here he was sleeping. I said to him, Sawyer, if I turn you in, you get busted. If I don't turn you in, I'll get busted too, but we just kept it quiet. And if I get too long-winded, you be sure and tell me. No, you're fine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, uh, I think the biggest thrill, when I set foot at the Seoul Airport, I said to myself, I'm here. Then we the Seoul Airport around noon. I managed to get a sack of popcorn. All these little kids together. I give one little kid a just little, and they all swarmed around, so I just gave them the popcorn. I remember very vividly. I took us by truck up the line about 37 miles north, and uh, I looked at my watch and Six thirty or seven o'clock, and I thought to myself, "It's going to be late when we get up the front." Mm -hmm. And it was. It was dark, but uh, that was when you arrived. Oh yeah. So, how old were you when you came back? I was twenty-one. How was that transition for you? Pardon? How was the transition coming home? Well, I was never so thrilled in my life. At 12.30 October 19th, the lieutenant handed me the papers and had some back pay coming. I went down in San Diego and in a hotel lobby there and sat there and walked across the street for a theater. From here to eternity. That was a pretty hot movie in them days. I there and went up to the airport about 5:30 and sat around there for a while and got home Wednesday afternoon about five o'clock. And my parents was there to pick me up. I just a few miles from the airport. So my father said to me after I got home, "You are so hard." He said, "What did they do to you?" I just took the rifle out and shot an innocent cat in the yard. Shot some bullet holes in the side of the car. No one wants to make a loud noise and not expect it or come up and he touch me on the shoulder. I just jump. I don't. Uh, I used to go to the VFW up to Sioux Falls a lot. And, once in a while, someone coming back. You can put your hand. Up. I just jumped up. <laughs> Loud noises. <sighs> if I don't expect them, maybe of course we expect them. It's a different story. But mm -hmm. and then I went to college for. This is no fabrication. I went to college for five years at Brookings. I got a master's degree in wildlife management. 
and I bragging. I think there's class about 300 to 400, act about third and top. And I studied. There's no partying. I'd go up there some Sunday morning and study. Don't let me cater this out. Just tell me when you're windy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you tell me anything you want to tell me. So. No, that's a. Uh, best food I had was in Pearl Harbor. I've been to many islands Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, Barbers Point, mm -hmm. Johnston Island. Had plane trouble there. We was there for a couple of days. Then we went to, on a Sunday morning. We went to Quads Lane. Then that afternoon, it took me to the seven of us to Japan. That was on a Sunday. The next day, that was, we went up the, <coughs> excuse me, up to the line. I remember this so vividly. I'm not fabricating. I can give you time a day and. Who was with me? I remember the lieutenant handing that paper and handing me some money because they had some back pay. I got fifty dollars a month hazardous pay, whether it's in the United States or overseas. Absolutely. So after college, you went to college, That's and then correct. what did you do after that? I worked Were you in an international truck? I did not use it because I was just so tired of being away from home. I didn't want to set out and peer somewhere after I'd been gone for three years and put up with more. I just, I just had it. Been in so many islands and cities, Denver, Kansas City, I slept on the airport bench one night in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Denver, that San Diego was probably 67 degrees. Got off the plane there, it was 10 below zero. Quite a, <laughs> Quite a jump. Yeah. <laughs> I think they took some of us up to California there, or Northern California where it was cold. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, I don't need this. <laughs> I come from where it's cold. <laughs> so you said that you wanted to be home. Were you close to any of your family while you were gone? Did you send letters? Somewhat. I waited six weeks after I got to Korea because I didn't want to say to myself, I'm a mama's boy. I waited six weeks before I heard anything, or I wrote them. And I had to do over again, I just do the same thing. I was disappointed on the way back, they flew us back, like I say. From us from uh, Japan to Wake Island. We got there about 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And I was kind of discouraged because I thought maybe I could see some uh, damage from World War II because that's only five short years ago. But we was there at night, we had something to eat and left again. Anything else you want to know? This is no oh. fabrication. I can tell you every date and who was with me, probably. Definitely. Yeah, no, you're doing really good. Um, do you know where you were when you heard that the war was was over? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. I remember Pearl Harbor just as plain. 6th of June, 1944, that was the longest day. They called it because U.S. and Britain and invaded France, and I just just remember that. And Do you remember the day you heard that the war you were involved in was over? Ah, uh, I was in Panmunjom. It would have been July twenty sixth, nineteen fifty two. Were you ever married or had any kids? I was married for a short time, but it's me now. <laughs> Did you have any family members? You said you have a nephew that, right? Correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, that lives close by. Did any of your family members ever show interest in joining the military? 
Well, I tell people if they have a son or something they mention in the Marine Corps, I said, have them talk to me first. I'll tell you what it's like. The discipline is so strict. I have no coordination. I couldn't keep a step. They just come up behind me and drill the could kick me in the seat. All right, Donald Duck. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, believe me, there was not hands off. They grabbed me by the back of the neck, kicked me in the seat, and so forth. If you had to do it again, would you choose the Marine Corps? I believe still? I would. I know what it's like. And, hmm. you know, I, I believe I would. But I would not recommend it to anybody who had never been there before. I would not. I want him, I would not want my nephew to join the Marines. I don't want him any wartime activities, but I would certainly advise against the Marines. People said I'd drink and smoke but I I come out of the Marines, never had a cigarette, never touched liquor, and I still don't to this day. So that wasn't an issue when you were there? No. Was it for other people? Did you see it a lot with downtime? Did people drink a lot, gamble, Well, smoke? yes. Some of them go up to L.A. or San Diego. Most of them went to L.A. And they had problems with liquor, but man, if you wasn't back there, if you was supposed to be at formation at 7.30 in the morning, you better be there. And I'm not saying two minutes late, one minute late, you better be there or you'd be reprimanded. So it's very easy to see that being in the Marine Corps d shaped your life. Try to be courteous. I was in Panmunjom, that was a peace camp. Sunday before I left, but approximately October 2nd, I left, because I remember that to the day. I thought, well, a year from now I'll be out on this day, because that's the day, well, the 19th I got out of the stage, get me there the 20th, I'd, You'd had three years in a day, which I had enough. That two weeks before the discharge, me they took me and me down to San Diego, I snapped to sit as a civilian and so forth. But how did your time in the military impact how you feel about war? or the military in general? The rich people make them, me and you fight them. That's my idea of war. Rich people make them. Over there getting killed in the Far East. Who's them making the wars? President and all them congressmen. 60 to 70 percent, boy I shouldn't be saying this or so not. <laughs> 60 to 70 percent of them was never in military service. Yet they have no qualms about sending me and thousands of other people of my age to work. But I don't want to get windy here. No, you're fine. So you, in general, have a negative feeling towards war. Oh, that's correct. That's yes. right. Is there any message you would like to leave for future generations? No, there is not. Okay. Anybody says they wasn't scared and they was over there, talk to me. First time I was under artillery fire, heard something were and I thought it was a bird going over. Pretty soon down the line of ways I seen artillery shells. That's when this guy that had been around for a while up there in the line, why he said, get down. And that was the first time. I remember right where the artillery was coming from on us. We walked right into a muddy hill. 
I said to myself, if any more artillery comes in, I'm not getting down because I won't get back up. I'm so tired in this mud. There were so many incidents that happened that I could just kind of gather, I hope, that I can remember vividly. No fabrication. I was in, last Sunday, I was in Korea, they took us up to Panmunjom, where the peace camp was. You probably don't remember. remember. But I remember when this looked off to the side, that North Korean guard was standing there just as straight as his arrow. I can still see him. I don't know why they took me and a few others up there, but I'm glad they did. Now I say it's about 37 miles north of Seoul, where I was Moonsani, they called it the railhead. Can you think of any other stories that you want to share or things you want to talk about? I've told you a lot, I'm sure. I've missed some, but still here. Dates and time, who I was with, which way I was facing when artillery fire came or something like that. Remember facing off that way? I'm mixed up in directions here. Facing off that way, and here come dragging them two bodies down the hill. Dragging them. A rope around one of them marked between his eyes and the other on his ankle. That's all I can see. If I was your age, you three. I wouldn't want to go back, but I wouldn't fight it. I wouldn't want to go back, but I wouldn't fight it. It'd be the Marines. Their discipline, if you can't take discipline, you better stay away. One day, there's an army squad or something that's training on Camp Pendleton. One of the guys must have been late getting formation. Somebody said to him, get out here on time. And this guy remembered to this day, yeah, I'll rush. He said that in the Marines, you'd been court-martialed. You don't say anything about it. I want to make out that like I was the toughest, but that discipline. Get paid. It was the end of the month. Maybe an hour afterwards, they drag out a tablecloth and they start playing cards. I never played. Some of them by eight, nine o'clock, they was broke. They always come to me, told me, Swede, need some money. It's John Cooley from Long Beach. I said, it's up there, get it. But I trusted him. I, as far as I know, he was on. Pay it back. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm out of questions here. Can you think of any other stories you want to tell or anything else you want to say? Not really. I got a couple souvenirs. Another incident. I got a potato masher hand grenade. That's North Korean or Chinese. I got a pineapple. That's a hand. I just disarmed him myself. Something else I got. Oh, I, right off and back there, a little where we had the tents. I walked back there one day, and there was a rifle or, or a burp gun. It was North Korea. I picked it up like a fool. Could have been booby trap. Then I got it back and told this Lieutenant Woodle, I got one. He said, Would you have to get the barrel? Plop. I said, okay. And then they got that done. He said, next thing you got to post a bond. Well, that was it. I kind of, I shouldn't say this. 
But that, that was, I didn't get uh, get it, but got a few pictures of, I'm not great on pictures, but I have got a, I think one picture from over in Korea there. Right Seoul was all shot up. I remember bullet marks going up the side of the wall when we got there. So that was when I was on my way over there. Best food I ever had was in Pearl Harbor. And that food was. We stopped there on the way over, I believe. And then. Another bombing range, Kulabi, they called it. That was part of the Hawaiian Island. We went over there before I went to Korea, I believe. And stayed there about a week and about a week and there was about the same crew that I went overseas with. I don't think we found anything unexploded but this Lieutenant Woodle, I still say to this day, he had no guts. He's watching right now. I still maintain it. Charles E. Woodle, he was the first lieutenant. All right, well, I think we're going to try to finish up here, Jim. Any any last thoughts you want to put on camera before we, we end? <clears throat> Proud of what the government done for me. I'm 70% disabled. Had gallbladder operation up the VA in Sioux Falls, and that's what's made in the condition I am now. I'm Slowly getting my strength back so I don't need a walker. But the biggest thing I want to do is go home. And I uh, hate to complain, but in this complex food, biggest issue to me, you can. I'm used to sometimes make my own food, go to Burger King, burgers, and make them. What I want to eat. Now here you get it. Everything seems to be so greasy. It's covered with grease, gravy and stuff. And vegetable, I don't care. I know I'm wrong. I don't care for vegetables like carrots and yeah, that about every meal. But I shouldn't complain that the government's paying for this, my time here. Best town I liked of the three big ones out in the coast was San Francisco. L.A. I didn't care for San Diego, all there was Marines and sailors. Tijuana was right south of San Diego, kind of a sin town. So I said, if you go down there and get in trouble, Probably never see you again. <laughs> 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 I never freaked the place. I, I never went on liberty. I could. I went on liberty once in three years when I in the United States. Because I just didn't want to take a chance of getting late. I didn't want to blow them. I wanted some money when I went home. I did have few dollars. Today I own about a half section of land and stocks and bound pretty good chunk. There's a couple monthly checks, one for disability and one for Social Security of course. Some of it rubs off on you. I mean I used Probably 10, 15 years ago, I used to gamble heavy, no limit. I had these feather parties, they call in these small towns. 
And I went up there for about six years in a row. The last time I played, I lost $113. What great amount. I could tell I just didn't have it anymore. My reflexes and memory wasn't quite there, so I'd never played anymore. If you ever gamble, don't trust anybody next to you. Anybody. Because I can't now, I used to show you some card tricks. Don't trust anybody. The second card just stack the deck. I have no desire to go back to Camp Pendleton. First I thought I did, I said, ah, I don't remember. I enjoy talking to other Marines very much. That about wears me out, I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll there's stop. Not, there's no fabrication. No, I believe you.